I'm joined by Cassie J, the director of the Red Pill movie, and Patricia Marcoccia, who recently put out The Rise of Jordan Peterson. And we've done interviews with, with both of you. And recently we put out the interview with you, Patricia, and there were a few comments that talked about the similarities between both your and Cassie's films and the reception to the films. That um, you're both independent female directors making uh, films about sort of controversial topics and have had sort of mixed responses, kind of what you might call a kind of encounter with council culture. And, and I, I also find there's a lot of similarities, like you're both from quite a liberal background. And I, I'm really interested in, in, in the, what the process was of making those films, whether there's any similarities. I know also in the, in the run up to this, you've both watched each other's films again. So uh, I'd be really interested in any kind of thoughts or reflections that you have on, on each other's work as well. Um, but, I, but I might just ask Cassie if I, if I could ask you, because it's a few, a few years since the Red Pill movie came out, just to recap what that experience was like and what the reception was like, and maybe the, see if there are any similarities that Patricia can pick up on uh, in The Rise of Jordan Peterson. Yeah, sure. Well, first off, thank you for having me on here, David. Always good to see you. And Patricia, it's so nice to meet you remotely. Uh, definitely a fan of your work and approach and uh, a lot of things that you did that I have a lot of respect for. So we can get into that in this conversation. But um, uh, if people are thinking, oh, where's Cassie been for a while? I've been De declining all interviews this year, pretty much except for one back in February. But uh, I've been laying low working on a new project. So, that, so that's where I've been. But uh, my film, The Red Pill, came out, uh, let's see, it was released in theaters October 7th, 2018, or 2016. And the reason I say the date is because I think it was just one week or a week and a half uh, after Jordan Peterson released his uh, professor against political correctness video, which is kind of what skyrocketed him into the mainstream. Uh, so for that reason, I, I think uh, m my experience of watching the rise of Jordan Peterson was really interesting because it was the same time frame of when I was starting to get out, to the, out in the public with the Red Pill movie and Jordan Peterson was as well. And so I could really relate to him in the rise of Jordan Peterson as far as the blowback um, that he received. And now, unfortunately, I can also relate to Patricia's <laughs> experience with blowback. Uh, but I do think that we have a ton of similarities with her documentaries, uh, as far as, you know, I'm the Red Pill is certainly more closely related to the rise of Jordan Peterson than it is to, you know, something about environmental issues or a, a million different documentaries that are out there. Uh, with that said, I think we also have a lot of differences within our documentaries, which is great because I, I love to see the various ways that documentaries can be made. Uh, one main difference is that the Red Pill movie was a first person account of my story. I, I included myself in the film through video diaries and it was one of the last decisions I made in making the film was to include my own journey of making the film. So it's kind of a a film within a film or a story within a story. Um, I was making a movie about the men's rights activists, the men's rights movement. And then I also happened to be documenting my experience as the filmmaker making the movie. And I combined the two to make the Red Pill movie. Uh, whereas Patricia took a, I guess what would be called a cinema verte approach, which is a fly on the wall. You don't know who the filmmaker is behind the camera. And it's this very uh, uh, intellectual, you know, kind of you feel like you're sneaking in on private conversations and um, it's just a glimpse into the private life of Jordan Peterson, which is, I think, the perfect approach for that story. Uh, so yeah, we can get more into the details, but I, I really enjoyed your film, Patricia. Thank you. Patricia, would you like to, to sort of pick up? Did you, do, do you, do you resonate with that? I mean, you, you've, you've quite more recently had some sort of cinemas saying that they won't show it and um, it, did you did you actually have protests or was it most it was mostly the staff in the cinemas that said that they weren't comfortable screening it mm -hmm. uh, we didn't have any protests but um, yes we had uh, three cancellations and we had um, 
we had several no's that are not the, the typical kind of no's that you get in the industry when you're approaching theater. So we hired a very experienced booker who's very well connected in the industry to cinemas and, and he just commented on how this wasn't what was typical because no is the expected response in this industry, but, but this was something different. And um, it definitely seemed like there was more of an ideological reason behind uh, some of the no's that we were getting. Some theaters were more frank than others. Like there was one theater that said to us something to the effect of, we think this film is interesting and fair, but we don't want to contribute in any way to the, um, the cult of Jordan Peterson, something to that effect. Um, but I at least respect the fact that that theater was honest um, versus you know, some theaters that said things like, well, there's no market viability for this film. And it's a film about Jordan Peterson who sold over 3 million books around the world. So it's hard to buy that argument. And something interesting that's happening now is I'm actually having a conversation with a theater that rejected our film. Um, and I'm having a conversation through the letter wiki platform. And uh, this is a, a theater that's three hours away from Toronto. So it's in a, a smaller town. Um, and I really respect the fact that the cinema owner is willing to engage and talk about this. And it sounds like she felt a bit unsettled about the decision that she made, but also felt like she was kind of between a, a rock and a hard place of not wanting to compromise her values of freedom of expression and, and conversation as a former librarian. Yet at the same time, she was nervous about the kind of pushback she would get from people in her own social circle if she were to screen the film um, and how it might affect patron, existing patrons and uh, the reputation of the theater. And she actually mentioned your film and uh, I'm just, I wanna find exactly what she said about it because she was mentioning any other instances she had where she's rejected uh, showing films and I'm just kind of scrolling through here. Oh yes, she said, uh, the only other film either than The Rise of Jordan Peterson that I've refrained from showing because I perceived and dreaded potential controversy was the men's rights doc, The Red Pill in 2016. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, I guess we are in the same camp then. <laughs> Have you seen The Red Pill, Patricia? Yeah, it has been a while since I watched it. I wanted to rewatch it for this interview, but didn't have the chance. Um, well, when I first heard about the film, it was in the early stages of this whole controversy unraveling with Jordan. And so I remember um, being really curious about you and being really curious about the film. And I got to see it at the University of Toronto. And uh, it was interesting to see some footage in the film at U of T of some of the protests there. I believe it was when um, uh, Farrell was doing his talk mm -hmm. there, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. So. So it, uh, it definitely shed a lot of light on, on the, the context of, uh, of what was happening. And I guess, I guess I've never really identified as a feminist myself, but I wasn't anti-feminist either. It was just not, not something I um, associated with my personal identity about, I guess I would say. But through the process of making this film, it's made me kind of think about it more and I mean there are things about feminism that I'm grateful for um, I guess this I guess I probably mo would most align somewhat with uh, first wave feminism in the sense that I am grateful for the women that fought for female agency um, so um, but I'm kind of diverging so anyway it, it just it was one of the things that got me thinking more deeply about uh, topics that I never really thought about well do I identify as this so I found um, your journey with that and with uh, investigating it um, interesting um, and I felt like the way the film ended if I remember correctly that's when you say that you dropped the label feminist and I was I, I felt kind of a sense like um, the story was unfinished in a way, at least your personal story with it in, in the sense of you're still maybe kind of figuring out where you stand with it all because you were really surprised with what you found. Um, and uh, I know that uh, when I watched your interview with David, one of the, um, I guess, criticisms that you've gotten with the film was um, the feminist that you 
had interviewed in the film and you mentioned how a lot of people tend to remember Big Red as if that's the only, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, I don't even know if that's her name or Red, maybe not Big Red. <laughs> um, people tend to remember her the most as if that's the only feminist you interviewed, but she isn't the only feminist that you interviewed. But I know that one of my impressions when I first saw the film was I was curious why there weren't people like Christina Hoff Summers or you know feminists that have more nuanced views that wouldn't necessarily be completely shutting down um, men's rights or the fact that obviously there are issues that men face too. Um, mm -hmm. But you did speak to that a little bit in your last uh, conversation with David as well. As, uh, and I can appreciate as a filmmaker that like there's only so much you can fit in a film. And uh, I, you know, at every q and I get asked, well, why didn't you include Sam Harris? And why didn't you include uh, mm -hmm. Jordan's Bible lectures? And so I get that as well. But I guess um, the, the point I'm trying to make is it just, it left me a little bit curious of like, where, where did you go after in, in terms of your own journey and your own views with it? Because in the, the film is about the men's rights movement, but then it's also about your journey through that and how it affected how you feel about feminism, at least as you knew it. So mm -hmm. I guess it just left me curious um, whether there was kind of more evolution from there or, um, or um, how you feel about some of the more nuanced views about feminism. And again, I've, I've never been terribly active in um, feminist circles and certainly not in the way that you have. So, you know, you, mm -hmm. you have a more tangible experience of what, what it means to, you know, have that identity and be active with it as well. So, yeah, that, that's, I guess, the kind of question that it left me with. Thank you. I really appreciate you giving a, a thorough uh, reaction to the film. I I hadn't seen the red pill in probably two years, at least since now. Uh, yeah. But then I watched it a couple weeks ago because it just for the first time became free on YouTube with ads. Uh, so I was like, oh, I'm just going to play in the background and see what I thought. And I was actually very shocked at... Um, how it felt feeling like a new viewer for the first, for really for the first time, because you know, you film for so many years and then you edit and then you see a million of the Editing screenings. Yeah. yeah. And it's really like, I mean, you can <laughs> replay it in your dreams. Like, you know, it like the back of your hand. And so I had this long period pass where I hadn't seen it. And then I watched it, a, I guess yeah. maybe a month ago. And, um, and I did think like that last line, I no longer call myself a feminist was like this bomb dropped and then just kind of, like drop the bomb and then run away and like you don't explain why <laughs> and I was thinking wow that's that is intense I could see why that really kind of irked people or made them stand up and cheer like there there were you know standing ovations at that line uh, but yeah I think you know just in the process of making it I knew that I was starting my story explaining that I've you know been a feminist my entire life and you know my work has been revolving or revolved around women's issues and so I I open with that as my identity it is I, I can see how you would feel like it was unfinished not explaining why I just say I no longer call myself a feminist and, and, and uh, more, not, not the film itself but more just um it felt like it was like the end of the film but the start of your own kind of transformation or journey like unfinished mm -hmm. in that yeah. And, and all, you know, it's a very quick answer. All that, that I've told people when they ask, well, why don't you call yourself a feminist? I I've dropped all labels. I mean, in, unless it's something that is actually like an identifying part of you, whether say you're gay or you're Christian or you're Republican, those are, you know, I think those are labels that help uh, communicate in a shorthand manner how you identify politically or religiously or your sexual orientation. But uh, to say feminist, it's not, um, I think, I really do think that the problem is everyone's definition of feminism is different. So to tell someone you're a feminist, that is not mean? actually communicating with them your views because you don't know what their definition is. I mean, what's really interesting as well is Having, having interviewed both of you and spent a little bit of time with both of you, there's a lot of suspicion in this area of covering these controversial topics in a sort of either a sensationalist way or a kind of bad faith way. Or, but but the, the impression I get from both of you, and I remember it was after I spoke to Warren Farrell um, 
Cassie, that the fact that you're in the film so much, I, I had not suspicion, but I did, I did wonder like how much of your journey was genuine and how much of it was, was for the camera and for the narrative. And talking to Warren, I realized, no, you've really gone in um, as a feminist, wanting to know more about it and had your mind changed by the experience. And I know Patricia, you are actually covering Jordan Peterson, that you are completely blindsided by the fact that the um, Professor Against Political Correctness videos came out because you were covering from the sort of Jungian perspective. And so you, you, you both kind of um, went in with a real, I mean, like I, I'm, I'm convinced that you both went in not wanting to kind of um, do a sensationalist film or in any way kind of exploit the material. It was very much in a sort of wanting to know like a, a really good faith attitude. Um, and, that, and that's a similarity I think that both of, both of you have. Right, right. I guess in both instances, we were surprised with what we, what, where the films took us, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And we set out, from what I've read about your story, Patricia, we both set out with a different film in mind, but then had to yeah. share the truth of what actually unraveled while we were filming. Um, yeah, some, also something that I really appreciate about your film is how much airtime you gave to critics of Jordan Peterson. And, you know, a lot of people with my film have wondered, oh, is she a men's rights activist? Was this a propaganda piece? Was it funded by men's rights activists? And all that I would say is no, those, <laughs> those assertions are not true. Um, but, you know, there is a lot of speculation about the agenda of the filmmaker. And I, I would think that someone that is really trying to be balanced and uh, give uh, give props to to both sides and both arguments for the audience to come to their own conclusion would give airtime to the critics of whatever you're following, whether it be Jordan Peterson or men's rights activists. So, um, but now you know, three years after the film's release, I a, a little part of me wonders was that the right decision because it didn't seem to matter in the end with the mainstream media smearing my name in the film and saying that it was propaganda or whatever else so including feminist uh academics and feminist professionals critiquing the men's rights movement within my film didn't seem to to help with the image of my film as being balanced uh so then i wonder well if i could have taken that maybe 40 minutes within my two hour film and actually gone into many of the other men's rights issues that I wasn't able to include because of the time constraints, things like false allegations or suicide rates or sentencing disparity, et cetera. So my question for you, Patricia, is um, was it hard for you to include so much airtime to the trans activists and to the critics of Jordan Peterson, like his friends Bernard and Will, um, rather than using that time to go more into Jordan's ideas and writings and teachings? Mm -hmm. um, in my case, no, it wasn't difficult to include those, um, those voices in the film. And I think for the kind of film I was trying to make, it was integral to it because mm -hmm. a lot of my film was about the polarized nature um, of this topic and how Jordan Peterson himself and his public persona became so polarized. And, and uh, if anyone uh, watching has seen our poster, you see Jordan portrayed as this kind of mythological figure with, with this divide on both sides of people approaching him as a kind of messiah or as a devil. Um, but then the film itself reveals him as this vulnerable human being. Um, so in order to make a, a film about that, I think it was really integral to include those voices. Um, and I know, and so I, I don't think, even though I, I know what you mean in that, you know, even with our film, it's like we, we worked really hard to show the nuance and to, to, um, kind of uh, build a, a comprehensive understanding of this from different perspectives, but you know, we still had some cancellations and whatnot. Um, but at the end of the day, I think the most important thing is the integrity of the film itself. And you know, regardless of how you know, people are going to um, perceive it and you can never really please everyone, unfortunately. But um, 
I mean, I know that when we had test screenings in our living room and when we brought in people from different perspectives and we had, you know, everyone from diehard Jordan Peterson fans, people whose lives have been changed from Jordan to self-proclaimed Marxists and feminists, uh, LGBTQ people, um, people who haven't heard of Jordan Peterson. And when we had them all in our living room and, and we were in this space where people could have genuine conversations, I feel like the kind of... Um, transcendence of the culture war that we were trying to achieve. I feel like in our living room it happened, but of course um, in theaters and, uh, and you know, through the eyes of, of the media, um, it's, it's much harder to achieve that. Um, so, so I think it was really important um, to include those other voices. And I would say, I wrote a bit about this, um, maybe it was in the area article, I don't remember where, but a lot of people use the word balance to describe uh, the rise of Jordan Peterson. And, and I get it and it, it kind of, it makes sense as a shorthand, but balance isn't actually what I was trying to. Uh, <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> to That's okay. um, balance isn't really what I was trying to achieve because there can be a superficiality to balance of, well, you know, we're, we'll include like X percentage of airtime to um, the opposition and, and whatever it is, but it was more so about um, creating a journey in the film that was kind of a roller coaster ride because that's what it was like for me witnessing all of this unraveling. And I think the truth is complicated and the truth is nuanced most of the time. And it certainly was the case for witnessing this story. So those those aspects were necessary in order to paint that really full and complex picture and to send people on that journey and to sometimes make people uncomfortable. And there have been, you know, the, the odd criticism from um, people who have said something like, well, you know, this film is, is unfortunate that this film could have been used as more of a tool to um, make people like Jordan Peterson more and to kind of convert them into followers. and. I, I think that's propaganda and that's not what I was interested in making. And the irony is that that's not what Jordan Peterson's at the heart of his philosophy. That's not what he's about either. So there's an irony there for um, people who are remarking on the film that way. Mm -hmm. So that's what I would say about that. I've got a slightly mischievous question that just came to me. Which, All right, let's go. <laughs> but, so there's, a, there's some suspicion uh, in this area of, um, using this controversy to help sell these films. So do, do you, and I, and I wouldn't necessarily say that that's a bad thing, like Jordan Peterson said on the Joe Rogan show that he's learned to monetize social justice warriors, that actually the more that people scream about it, if you've got a good product, then actually it helps the, the marketing. Do you think it's yeah. helped the marketing in any way? Would you say that you'd ever, you've ever played to that, either of you? Mm -hmm. Uh, I would say uh, for our film, um, it, it's helped in some ways and it's hurt it in others. And uh, we're very well aware of both. And we knew that, so, you know, our, our film, the premiere happened in Toronto, September 26th of this year. And um, it was right around that time, I don't remember if it was before or after, that the news came out about the Carlton Theatre in Toronto canceling our week long run that was scheduled for right after the premiere. And, uh, you know, I knew there were a lot of risks involved with um, this story being public and being interviewed about it. But at the same time, I also thought, um, you know, it, it deserved to be public. If, if, you know, people are asking about it, I'm going to answer questions about it. Um, so obviously, there are the ways that it helped the film is, you know, when, when something gets canceled, people want to know, well, what is it? What's so bad about it? Why? Like, it, it arouses curiosity, and it's natural, and it's human nature. And it also made more media outlets interested in our story. Um, I, I frankly wish that more of them were interested in reviewing the film, but most of them were interested in the story of the cancellation. So there's that side of it. Um, but then the ways that I would say it hurt the film is, um, because the story that's being reported on is the cancellations, it sort of starts to put you in the same box of perception of, okay, well, so you're, we got accused of adopting the same narrative as Jordan Peterson with, with regards to cancellations. And um, it's interesting. We were just doing an interview about this yesterday and we were talking about how there's something so ironically 
kind of postmodern about dismissing the reality of what's happening as simply a narrative. <laughs> and so that actually heightens uh, Jordan Peterson's argument. Um, and I understand where that criticism comes from because there is this benefit to um, you know, gaining more attention when cancellations are happening and you know, we acknowledge that. Um, but at the same time, then we're sort of put in this box, we're accused of things like that. And um, you know, there's certain media outlets that then become more interested in covering the story than others. And so uh, it's, uh, it's the more conservative media outlets. So you know, we, when we're trying to transcend a culture where it's very difficult to navigate a media space that you know, where you're immediately going to be put into a certain box. Um, and the other negative thing about that cancellation is that, I mean, the, the biggest difficulty that I say we faced is that I, I really wish that our film could have gotten more screenings in mainstream and art house theaters. And a lot of those theaters look to the major markets like Toronto and New York. And when we had that cancellation in Toronto, a lot of all the surrounding theaters said, okay, so I'm not going to touch that. And we knew that was happening, but now through this conversation I'm having in the letter wiki platform, um, this theater owner admitted that that happened in her case. So it's very um, gratifying to actually have something to point to that's concrete evidence of what we knew was happening. So in some ways it helps, in some ways it hurts, I guess I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely agree on a lot of those points. And it is ironic how the reactions to our films really do go to support the the topics discussed in the films even more. You know, within my film, we talk about the silencing of these ideas and here the film was being uh, pulled from many theaters. The most common uh, protest deplatforming kind of experience for the red pill was actually being accepted into theaters and then either feminist activists or probably ex extremist activists usually would protest the theater and send threats and and then sometimes also board members uh going against the theater owner saying that you need to pull the film so so oftentimes it was a booked screening that was then removed which is why i, I think that's a perfect example of um an attack on freedom of speech and and uh you know a, a censorship kind of you know form of censorship as if it's a book in a library that's now being pulled and burned <laughs> uh so because some people said that it, oh it's not censorship because you don't get to screen your film in this theater well we were going to screen the film in the theater and people paid to watch it in the theater and then it was removed so um but yeah the, what, what was the question again <laughs> i'm trying to remember was there any temptation to play up to that narrative oh. i'm being silenced um, and, and did you maybe play up to it a little, a little bit? I actually did not. And, you know, people can believe me or not. I, I don't know how else, how many different ways to say the truth and, and have people actually believe it because it just doesn't work apparently. But um, yeah, I did not play into it. We had no publicity, you know, machine or group of people sitting around a round table or even myself sitting at a table alone pondering okay how can I get this film banned or censored or get people riled up and and I I certainly know that happens because you know I've, I've seen it within feminist communities and men's rights communities where they are trying to think of ways to shock and appall or you know get attention with you know like what's free the nipple you know that that's a way to get uh, printed in the media and, and you know, the shock value. And then the men's rights activists also do a lot of things that can uh, can get, you know, negative media attention, but they think, all right, any attention is good attention. Um, so I, I really didn't stoke any kind of controversy fire. I mean, except for making my film, but I don't think that was <laughs> set out to stoke the controversy. I was trying to share what I learned. But um you know, I, I honestly, I was perfectly content if the film just, you know, fell on death's ears, but, but I, sorry, death's, death's ears. Um, but I knew that, you know, this is the journey I went on, that this is the best representation of the people I interviewed. And, and this, you know, it's just to meant to start conversations, but say it never really got out in the world and it just, you know, collected dust. I, I would still sleep okay at night. Um, so the, the protests and the controversy for me, it was actually just a big pain. Uh, you know, I, 
I think it's definitely a double-edged sword, which is what Patricia, I think, was talking about, where, yeah, it's great that more people are hearing about it because of the controversy and maybe going to see it because they want to see what is this film that's banned. <clears throat> but then also a lot of people have actively not seen my film because they've just chosen to be on the side that we're going to be against this film and we need to unite and stay together. And I don't even want to watch it. I don't want the filmmaker to get, you know, any of my views on Amazon prime or, you know, pay for a rental or whatever on iTunes. Uh, so they, I mean, I've brought up the film, the red pill at different parties and people not knowing I was the filmmaker and they would just roll their eyes and goes, Oh, that trash. And I'm like, Oh, did you see it? And they're like, no. I'm the filmmaker. <laughs> but uh, so it is a double edged sword. And, you know, in an ideal world, the film would have gone to Sundance uh, or South by Southwest and done the kind of proper indie way of getting into the mainstream of getting accolades and recognition from your community of fellow filmmakers and, you know, people in the industry that that respect the way cinema is made. Um, but we didn't have that option. You know, we submitted to festivals and, you know, I applied for grants. We never raised funding through that way, which is why I did the Kickstarter campaign. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I guess it, to categorize it in my head, I guess the way to make it as an indie filmmaker now is to either be accepted by the mainstream and get into the big film festivals or immediately get great distribution. And just, I think, you know, that's, the easier way. I mean, as far as the opposite option is you get declined from all the mainstream that the mainstream media really tries to smear you in every different way. And really the only way to get out to the public is to have it be this talked about, whether it be on the forums online or just word of mouth and people being shy about sharing it because they don't know, you know, what side you're on. And, and it becomes like this nefarious or, or like, you know, secretive kind of movement. And that ended up being the case with the red pill. But um, yeah, I certainly didn't, I didn't seek it out. And I mean, this is something Patricia was hinting at before about that we're in an environment where a lot of things are, you could say weaponized, that, that certain topics are immediately sort of drawn into this sort of culture war dynamic that everyone kind of assumes that you're on one side or the other. How's that been for you both, like covering something that's been this um, polarizing. What's the experience been? Has it been at all kind of eye-opening or radicalizing or how has it shifted your perspectives? It, it's been, uh, well, it's been challenging. Uh, it's um, opened my eyes to a lot of things and uh, there's, there's a lot more like politically that I've um, come to learn and also to question in myself and kind of shake out some beliefs that were more superficial. Uh, but also, um, it, it's also something that was just coming to mind with this is I would say that we also experienced some of this um, kind of pushback on the right as well. So for example, I mean, because we, we sort of gave up on mainstream in our house cinemas at, at some point, we were looking to schedule screenings at churches and with local groups and uh, Jordan Peterson meetup groups and just see, you know, what, what little venues we could rent out. And that's how we built our North American tour. Um, and at one point we were talking with Turning Point and uh, they, basically explicitly alluded to the fact that they were interested in seeing whether there were parts of the film that they could use for the next election. And I was glad that once they saw the film, uh, which, which, you know, I, I was very um, against it now because I'm not interested in the film being used as a propaganda tool. Um, but I was glad that once they saw the film, we never got a call back and that meant, okay, we're doing something right here. Um, and uh, so it just happens to be that you know the left and the progressives those are the people that are running the art house and mainstream cinemas because most of the artists tend to be on the left and so um i think this phenomenon very much exists on the other side too it's just that those aren't the people typically that are running the cinemas and there have been a couple of cinemas that after hearing about the cancellations they contacted us and said we'll screen your film at our cinema and uh, 
you know, it, it tended to be the like Trump supporters and more conservative minded people um, that were running those cinemas that approached us. I don't know if I answered your question, though. <laughs> I'm kind of trailing off. And if you didn't, it was an yeah. really interesting digression. So. <laughs> so as far as I understand the question, David, you're asking with this polarization around our films, how we kind of landed right. on the uh, on the field. Is that right? Is yeah. That yeah. And what, what's the impact been on, on you personally? Uh, I know I remember from, from our interview before, I think Warren Farrell said, you went to him to, to ask, oh, am I going to lose lots of my friends and hoping that he would kind of put your mind at rest? And he said, yes. <laughs> um, so yeah, just how, how has it been making a film about something this uh, topical, but this polarizing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually many of my interviews warned me that if I tell the truth, I will be essentially burned at the stake for it. Uh, and Warren Farrell did tell me that, um, I don't know if he told me while we we're filming, maybe after the film was released, but he said, you will lose a lot of your friends. And so I started asking him about what he experienced. And this was one of the few times that I saw Warren break down crying. I hope it's okay to say that. But uh, but yeah, he because he was so involved in feminism through, you know, the late 60s, 70s and beyond, and then and then really uh, started digging into men's issues and and, you know, adding <laughs> okay, I'm, my family says I'm the queen of bad analogies, and I thought of this new bad analogy that helps explain what the red pill was trying to do, and I think what Warren Farrell's work tries to do, which is, imagine this jar, and there's uh, pennies being put in the jar, and, you know, feminists for so long have been saying, oh, you know, we got uh, human sex trafficking, and we have uh, maternity issues, and we have, you know, sexual assault, and all these things, and keep putting in sense. And uh, Warren Farrell and other um, other academics, or if you want to call them activists, are trying to bring men's issues to this discussion and try to throw their two cents in, literally. And you know, everyone else in the gender political world is throwing it out, saying your cents are not allowed in this jar. So it's not uh, it's not the, that the red pill is trying to say, oh, this is actually the way you know, that the world works, that women have the power and that men are the only oppressed gender, the only gender that has issues. Not that at all. It's just adding the two cents to an already very um, vast amount of films and books and podcasts and whatever else about feminist issues or trans issues or whatever else. Uh, so the reason I have to say that is because I, I still do have a lot of uh, of my feminist friends that have remained my friend and they would even say, despite <laughs> the red pill. Uh, but, you know, they have hangups that, that they're thinking that I'm discounting women's issues or, um, or all these other things. And so I, I'm just trying to illustrate that it's just adding to the discussion. And unfortunately, that's the sore spot uh, right now, at least in the last few years, probably a lot longer than the last few years, but at least with the release of the red pill, um, I've really seen that that's the area that you're not allowed to speak up. And, um, you know, I, at first, so talking about the polarization, I also want to add that you can't choose your fans. And that's something that has been difficult for me is that there are a lot of people who've I wouldn't say a lot. It's definitely in my very small percentage of all the fans of the red pill, but there is a small percentage of people who I would not align with and I would not want them representing the film or sharing with people and, you know, them being the spokesperson for it. But nevertheless, they, they are fans of the film and they're trying to get it out in the world. And, and it is, so, it is a weird thing that I've had to, um, I guess, accept is you can't pick your fans and you know i it sounds like patricia's liberal or at, at least was at some point um i i've been progressive liberal most of my life and then the last few years i would say i'm more centered but i'm definitely not right and uh and we do have a lot of supporters on the right and because the film is released a month before trump was elected uh then, you know, it came out at this highly 
polarized time. And, and a lot of people who attended our film screenings had the MAGA hats on. And I had a, a feminist friend of mine, a longtime friend of mine who went to a screening of the film in Denver, Colorado. And she, she was, and I don't use this word facetiously, but she was triggered by seeing so many MAGA hats in the theater. And she had to walk outside and collect herself before the film started because just seeing that angered her. And long story short, she went to the film with her boyfriend and that night they ended up breaking up because of their differing views on the film. So, um, you know, I hate hearing stories like that because I don't want to think that the film is dividing people in that way. But I have also heard so many more stories of the film uniting uh, partners and allowing husbands or sons or fathers to open up about their difficulties and have, uh, you know, have their stories fall on receptive ears. And um, so it, it's been hard, but I do hope that our films will stand the test of time and that they can be looked back on, you know, 20 plus years from now and just be an example of uh, not only the content of the film, but also the reactions to the film making a statement about the culture we live in today. And so in that way, I think our films have many layers of, of lessons and, uh, you know, kind of having your finger on the pulse of society to see how they react right now. I'd, I'd love to, to ask you both what you've got coming up next, what your, your next projects are. I guess, Patricia, you're probably still in the middle of promoting Rise of Jordan Peterson, but have you given any thought about what you're going to be doing next? Mm -hmm, definitely. Um, so the, the next big project I want to tackle is I want to go back to the original film that I was making about Jordan and his friendship with uh, Indigenous carver, Charles Joseph. And I think we may have talked about this in our previous interview. Uh, I, I don't remember how in depth we went into it, but uh, the initial story that I was making for a year and a half before Jordan uh, released those videos was about how Charles Joseph, who's from the Kwakwakwak Nation, he lives on the west coast of Canada. Charles's family was adopting Jordan into their family. And uh, the reason for that was because of the significance of the artwork that Charles was um, giving to, making for Jordan. There's, there's a, a protocol that has to be followed and it's not just a matter of buying art. It's there's, there's sacred things that are in their sacred symbology and stories that are in this artwork and so there's a responsibility that comes with that and so Jordan is now his brother and so I was filming uh, sacred ceremonies that were taking place and also the renovations that Jordan was doing to his home he was adding a third floor modeled after an indigenous longhouse and it was filled with Charles's artwork. So for a year and a half, I was making a film about that. And that's what I intend on going back and finishing now that uh, we've just wrapped up our tour. We still planning some screenings and we will be um, we're planning a small tour in Asia in the spring in March. Um, but uh, yeah, that's that's what I'll be tackling next. And the film is tentatively called Mechala, which in Kwakwala, which is Charles's language, means to dream. Mm. And Cassie, you said you've been um, hibernating for, for a while, what have <laughs> you got coming up? Uh, well, I'm working on a, a new feature now. I'm very excited about it. We'll be filming all throughout 2020. And uh, so The Red Pill was my third feature documentary. The first was called Daddy I Do, and it was about women's issues. Uh, the second was The Right to Love, and it was about LGBTQ issues. And, you know, The Red Pill was about the men's rights movement. So I, I've definitely been uh, you know, gender politics has been my wheelhouse. Uh, but this film is the first time really kind of stepping out of that. Uh, although gender politics is a huge topic, I would say this new film is even bigger and more widespread. Uh, so just, I guess a little teaser, I won't go into the whole thing, but uh, this film will be looking into trauma. And something that I've really learned uh, from all my previous work is that trauma does not discriminate. It's across all genders, all socioeconomic statuses, all races, all ages. And uh, so, you know, I've seen, I've been filmmaking for, well, since 2008. And uh, I've seen and heard so many heartbreaking stories. And it seems like it's actually a, it seems like everyone has trauma in their, in their past or something that they're eventually going to face that's difficult. And um, so this film aims to 
to look at how we can heal a lot of these wounds and uh yeah so i'm really excited about it and um i'll be filming all of 2020. rebel wisdom is a new sense making platform bringing together the most rebellious and inspiring thinkers from around the world if you're enjoying our content then you can help us make more by becoming a subscriber which will give you access to a load of exclusive films also you can then join our group zoom calls to discuss the ideas in the films and you can send us ideas for questions for upcoming interviews. And if you're a regular viewer, you'll know we talk a lot about the value of embodying or actually living out the ideas that we talk about. So that's why we run regular events in London. Check out the links on the website for more. And hope to see you soon.